nervous about myself since I've come to AI conference. And I have been asked that we'll just recite questions which could have been done by AI. So I'm thinking about what next. So maybe I'll enjoy it today. Uh, you never know when AI takes over me tomorrow. Uh, but with that, uh, I have a very esteemed panel with me. Uh, uh, I will, uh, as, as you heard about the introductions, uh, there is this whole consortium out here sitting wherein there is a new age tech, uh, there is a PFSI, uh, there is uh, uh, there is very interesting core deep uh, uh, fintech work uh, that one of my friend does. So kind of something very interesting to look at and from the perspective of GCCs. So thank you so much for taking time out today. Uh, maybe we'll try and um, add some value uh, to the audience out here. As you know, the world has become customer first and we totally believe in it. So maybe some takeaways that I believe that at the end of the session will be useful for all of you. With that, uh, let me just start off with the first question. Um, so GCCs have been in our country for the last 25 years. DOS started small. However, now have become a very important capability center for all of us, you know, when we see globe as one, and especially in BFSI. Uh, if I take the lenses of BFSI, and maybe Amar, I will start with you. Uh, if I take the lenses of BFSI and the GCC construct, earlier it used to be an op center. Slowly then started working like a together center. And today, there are several things that uh, work from India to the world. So in terms of innovation uh, that the GCCs have to offer, so how do you think that what kind of an innovation is being offered from Indian GCCs to the world? Any take on that? Sure, sure. Thanks, Arun. So I think the GCC, if I may say, is a, is a local construct. We have come to describe the centers. I think in several organizations, including uh, MasterCard, it is not looked at as a remote development center anymore. We are another center location office within the organization. I think that's just an, uh, to put things in perspective. The, the business for which I am, uh, the GCC that I am part of, is open banking, which is within the BFI, BFSI space, very specific. Uh, that, is, that is the kind of work we do. And what that entails is you put the consumer customer, individual, or the small and medium enterprise, small and medium business at the center and you give them complete control of what they want to do with their banking data, who they want to share that data with, for what specific purpose, for how long and what parts of the data. So that's where you put the customer which includes small and medium enterprises at the center. And open banking really is a, it plays a key role in building the innovation that enables this for MasterCard. So what 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 do we really, really do? So we are in the our focus is on building that data access. So we are talking about building or developing API based integrations with banks and uh, financial institutions so that the user permission data, right? The user is key. Their permission is key. Their consent is key. But user permission data making that available to fintechs and other financial services companies who can then use that data and structure products, services, features which eventually benefit the end customer, which could be an individual or a business. So that's really the, the innovation and I know in the interest of time, the areas in which we, we are developing uh, this innovation, uh, innovation approaches in conjunction with global teams is for example facilitating account opening. One large area is in the lending space, whether it's mortgage lending or home loans or small and medium business lending. Payments, because MasterCard is a payments company. Payments is where there's a lot of work happening with open banking, where we are, through the use of AI and machine learning, we are essentially build, uh, enhancing payment, <coughs> implement, building higher level of payment res resiliency, uh, fraud detection is a key part, risk mitigation, and so on and so forth. Excellent. So, so there's some very interesting work happening, and this consent management is a big key Though we are way too far in terms of uh, how our uh, PI data is being used. So I'm sure some amazing disruptions uh, what you and your team is doing. But moving on to Molly, and Molly, I would not term people as GCC, it's a core dev center as the world knows. But if you have to share some clips 
from India to the world, yeah. then where is that value addition coming? Yeah. Great question. I think it's super important for all of us as GCCs to think, you know, away from cost, cost of control, should think about value. So if you think about PayPal, uh, in the kind of work that we do in PayPal, like Amar said, you know, we we are we mimic the parent company, right? We are not like an offshore center. So uh, we have data science, you know, a uh, lot of AI related work that happens. Uh, we have uh, product engineering, we have product, several products are driven out of the India centers for the globe. So when you think about building products for the globe, there is a uh, significant amount of innovation you think about it from a customer angle which you mentioned. The, the example that I, you know, two things that I wanted to share. One, see, we wanted to consciously change the India centers to uh, more, uh, up, you know, more from an execution to an innovation center. So when you hire talent from other product companies, when you hire talent from universities, and you, you know, give them the freedom and also give them some structure on how to think about innovation, how do you think about filing patents. We've seen a significant change. You know, we are number two, India centers are number two, you know, uh, in PayPal. In terms of number of patents filed and number of patents granted. And that transformation has happened over the last five, six years. And it's both bottoms up and top down, where you make innovation a value in the company. But also you invest in talent, you put an innovation lab, you recognize them for innovation and you create mentorship and you, you know, you basically get ambassadors who come and talk about how a day-to-day -day process that you do can be innovative. So incremental innovation, but also step function in terms of how you basically integrate payments into, you know, augmented reality. This is something one of the college grads did, you know, a year into the company. And this is, I'm talking four or five years back, right? It's amazing to see. Another example I'll share with you, given that we're talking about DNSI, we set up a credit data science team in India. Uh, and the credit data science team focused on buy now, pay later. Right? All of us know buy now, pay later is one of the hottest credit products out there. And in buy now, pay later, we don't use any credit score. So the team actually had to build models based on, you know, if the customer was already a PayPal customer, use non-credit data to kind of come up with a you know a risk model, or kind of use you know your zip code or something like that, right, to come and predict. And you know they turned out a very good job, high acquisition you know uh, rates, you know very low fraud rates. An example of how you could sit further away from a mothership, but when you're given a problem, you can actually you know put together a team and come and solve it in an innovative way. And a lot of it is iterated, to be very honest with you. It's not like the first solution is the best solution. But if you put your mind hard to it, you can iterate and you know, get to a really good uh, you know, state. And those are two good examples that I want to share in terms of how given you know, good structure, given support, given an opportunity, it's okay to fail, but you know, we'll all help each other and get to a better place. You can see grounds of innovation coming and making a difference in the company. Those are the two things that I want to share. Excellent. I, I must say for the group, uh, it's a very proud moment if uh, if all global, where in India is contributing as the second largest patent filing hub as well as the patent granting, that shows the potential of thinking mind that we have in the country. And uh, I think at the same time, Dom Molly touched upon and for the room to understand the complexity of it, that what the adjacency data would be to come closer to consumer for products or services. So think about it in Black Friday, which is a two-day event, there is two plus trillion dollars of transaction that happens. Now think about the data if somebody has to find adjacency towards that. Uh, I, I, I forget the route between Electronic City to Marathali, think about two trillion of data they are finding. So Molly, this is uh, really amazing. Thanks for sharing. Uh, so uh, Sameer, uh, changing gears, uh, you know, this, uh, you, you work in a very interesting space. You know, it's like uh, for the room to understand, if before I disclose the area, it is like I remember in my childhood that uh, racing car video game. Uh, you never know from where what will come, touch, hit, go and move and you still have to uh, cross the bar. Uh, so KPO industry that you run, it's so sensitive, there's so much of information that you handle, uh, plus for the world from India. Uh, how do you see the regulatory landscape to be? 
is it supportive is it being flexible has it matured to support the business what's your view on it if you have to share it with the room who are into the kq business thanks uh, so excellent question so i think bfsi for very well reasons known is one of the highest you know highly regulated or the highest most regulated industries in the world uh, because we deal with people's money so um, compliance and regulations uh, though never intended to be constrained to blockers but at times it tend to be right? and therefore i think also one of the reasons why bfsi was probably the probably the last of the industries to come and set up gccs and capitals and uh data residency regulations data privacy regulations um what can you process what can you send offshore and not all that uh, you know has played a role in it i think with the amount of technological innovations coming in regulations will always be playing a catch up uh at at any stage regulations are always a step behind uh they are always evolving and that leads to room for ambiguity and uncertainty at times Uh, I think not just you know my company but most of the global uh, capacity centers or cap tables as they were they called as I think you know they play a significant role in helping their parent organizations to be ready for regulatory compliance in the world. Uh, examples so risk reporting for example you know is a big area for for the FSI uh, and then again okay, you know you have different types of reporting that one needs to comply depending on where you are. it's different in us it's you know quite different in europe it's different in asia um very little you know common ground there but then you know offshore locations on offshore centers like ours they help the parent organization as well as in my case the customers to be ready right by taking the advantage of all those support so we can work when you know when the best sleeps uh we we help you know companies and customers with data aggregation data collection data validations uh preparation of reports uh filing of reports uh, right and then all that basically is done by taking into account uh governance frameworks or compliance frameworks that generally you know we set up which are aligned to globally accepted and globally required regulations like gdpr ccpa what not uh then you know there are uh, things that we do which are to you know have proper access control mechanisms in place uh, there are stuff that we do to ensure that uh, you know there is always that right person having access to the right information at the right time uh, and technology significantly plays a big role there so for example cloud technology has has become an enabler of sorts to enable this model of global centers you know to be working together very uh, you know homogeneously and harmoniously uh, and therefore i think compliance has started to become an enablement because centers globally are becoming you know more aware of you know what is required and what needs to be done and in the processes right from you know the way right from the step when it is designed compliance and you know being in adherence to practices and the laws i think you know that's building up big thing So I think in a way uh, they have started to become enablers, uh, but at the same time, you know, awareness is a big, you know, requirement, and I think global capability centers have started to play. Excellent. So just for the room, and I think this is an important take. I have been told that uh, I understand BFSI as I personally believe nobody can understand BFSI. Uh, it has been ever evolving, but. uh bfsi in regulatory terms if i have to put a perspective what somebody was saying there is bank there is insurance there is nbfc there is fintech and then there are fis sebi rbi etc uh now the way somebody describes if i crystallize it for the room if paytms can get listed if nbfc is in insurance can be the seventh largest player in the country if one of the banks that we enjoy in the country is among the top 10 in the world in fact now they have come to top 5 and few of the public sectors they are seventh 
in insurance domain in the world, wherein they have an aspiration in next five years to become the third largest. And by the way, many of these numbers are being enjoyed by China than many other countries that we may feel so that the other countries enjoy. Now, if we have reached this far, then certainly, you know, what Samir is trying to say is that regulatory is thinking hard, thinking fast, as it is ever emerging space, but nobody is stopping the growth. So if anybody is thinking about getting into a venture into this business, maybe this is the best time. Thank you, Samir, for sharing this insight. Rakesh, coming to you, we, you know, your, the question that I want to throw to you, Anwar, if you want to join in, please feel free. Uh, but this is very interesting. Culturally, we are so nice guys. Huh? How many of us believe culturally we are nice guys? Yeah? No, no hands. Okay, now we all have got uh, uh, West End uh, sort of uh, uh, painted. But um, the whole collaboration, the collaboration, ways of working, engagement, empathy, leadership around this. Uh, everybody knows now today that we are great in AI, ML, microservices, cloud. Uh, you know, tech, etc., etc. But bringing a pie to GCC around these leadership traits, you know, what few dimensions that you see wherein GCCs have matured in the index and they go hand in glove with the, uh, you know, global leadership and enjoy the seat at the table. What those two, three things that you see has matured and is working really well? Absolutely. So uh, I'll begin with a construct that working for the banks almost three decades, JP Morgan, HSBC, Deutsche, and now Wells, uh, I realized that first time in human history, personal technology has taken over office technology. Uh, let me do a show of hands in the audience. Fifteen years back, hang on your hearts. How many of you went to office on a weekend to take a printout of a resume? I can understand you don't raise your hands. Uh, but fast forward 2024, today we have apps like Book My Show, Make My Trip, 100% stay through. When you come to a bank, you still have those grey screens with green figures appearing there. Uh, AS400 or Cobol or Pascal, because banks have said heavily regulated in the people's money. Uh, coming to the point on collaboration, as the gentleman from MasterCard really said in the beginning, uh, being associated with Transitions, transformation, automation over the last 30 years. Uh, first, the capital started with reporting functions, do it for me. Then it came to enable me. Then it came to partner with me. And now we are talking about lead. And thanks to FinTech and the reg tech, regulatory tech, which is catching up on FinTech, uh, is that uh, uh, there is more dependence of the India GSG. See the cross captives I have seen. And on collaboration, Two ways collaboration is improved. One is the horizontal collaboration across the silos. If you are impl implementing an end-to-end solution, you still have to look at end-to-end process. First, streamline the process. We are very good at automating problems. Streamline a 17-step process to 10. Then look at what customer experience, employee experience need. Go to your technology stack and pick those plugins like intelligent APIs, a bit of machine learning, perhaps RPA and workflows and a bit of deep learning depending on the requirements. But how the collaboration is improved because you can't do this inside. You have to work with your technology, you have to work with your UAT testing, you have to work with other functions. So not only that collaboration is improved, bigger collaboration is now, as we chat in the deep brain, is with the onshore partners. Onshore partners are more curious in terms of what you're doing, lift, shift and fix, because almost all the transformation happens after offshoring they lose the sleep over GCC is doing something stupid. So how to make sure on a daily basis you partner with your onshore partners so that what we are doing in tactical automation is consistently aligned with the strategic transformations happening. Once you have that trust and transparency, I believe sky is the limit in terms of what GCC in India can do in terms of getting seat at the table. Excellent. So tactical versus strategic. And that's the keyword I'm picking up from Rakesh. Uh, Amar, you have anything to add to this? I do, but yeah, if you have time only, then otherwise yes. I. Yes, no, go okay. ahead. So I think I'll, I'll try to summarize things a little fast, but 
one realization we had recent times, while we all know uh, teams in GCCs need to ask the why, why are we doing this and be more proactive, assertive, ask questions, challenge, whatever. It's always been, it's been part, it's been a growing part of our DNA over the last, I would say, decade. The decade before that was more, little more kind of throw it over the wall and we work on it and turn it around. I think the one realization we are, which is why we have, we are actually focusing on that is, I, I come from a GCC which is more high tech and technology focused. We know the how, we know how to design, how to build, how to develop, how to implement and how to run systems and platforms and products. But do we know why we are doing what we are, why are we building that? And then the product function comes in and they design the what, what are we building to meet the why's. I think the gap between, the gap that our current GCC team members have of an understanding of the why, which is still there, and an understanding of the what, I think that is the gap we are now uh, looking to bridge. And when, when we get, when we shrink that gap, the effectiveness, responsiveness, quality, innovation, all of the what we do will just go up. Excellent. I think both are very relevant if somebody is vying for a career growth. I think tactical versus strategic and joining how and why uh, both becomes very crucial. Thank you both for sharing this insight. Uh, coming to, you know, and, and again I'll, I'll pick some real life connotation before I put this question. I can ask that, you know that our headmaster Sajuti, a fantastic person who got us here. Uh, you know, she said that we need to have a rapid fire. And this is a rapid fire question where in, trust me, you guys are going to enjoy this because they are going to reveal something which is very valuable for all of us. Um, so we start with Amun. Uh, you ready? Um, um, I am not going to go in Karan Johar's mode where you make 20 enemies then 5 friends out. So this question is going to make more friends. Which is, which is around, uh, if we have to share it with the room, uh, any one top trending fintech disruption coming in next 3 to 4 years from your vantage point, what that would be and why? So this is not a current John answer, one word. <laughs> I just want to talk about it. Okay, so I think really the use of top of mind for me, for us, the use of AI and machine learning in areas such as fraud detection and getting better insights on data, advanced analytics. Awesome, awesome. AI, machine learning, fraud detection and advanced analytics, which is pre-wedding. Can I add on that? So yes, yes. So I think the other angle to what uh, Amar said is on the personalization piece, which is where Saurav, you started the whole uh, panel with this customer centricity. So people want experiences where you, the company is expected to know them, right? That's what they want. And so the more you know them and then tackle problems proactively, then, you know, the experience is so much better, then adoption is higher and then loyalty becomes higher as well. So in a sense, the risk problem is also an important problem, the rent problem is also an important problem, but personalization is also an important problem when you call and say, hey, you know, I have a problem like this and the customer service agent actually saying, oh, I know why you're calling and then tackling it. And at the same time, when you come and try and use a product, I know, hey, this is the financial instrument you always use. This is the shipping address you always use for this type of product. That is also important. That's where AI can be such a game changer. Awesome. And Molly, on the similar lines, if I ask you from your vantage point, knowing there is so much of cutting edge that PayPal does, if you take a moonshot and say that this is one thing in my view trending emerging which is going to disrupt the market down the line, what that one thing would be? I think uh, today, yeah, it's a great question. Today, conversion continues to be a challenge. Right, like if you take a, uh, you know, take a merchant, for merchants especially the SMEs, conversion continues to be a challenge. Cross-border trade continues to be a challenge. And I think that, you know, companies like PayPal continue to have significant opportunities to make the world one. Right, and that's where I feel, you know, you know, like Samir said, compliance is actually a market, you know, it's an advantage, it's an IP literally, because it's a huge barrier for entry. And so companies that have this, you know, where they, meet compliance standards across the globe, huge advantage. You can serve SMBs across the globe, you can drive high conversion. See the personalization story that I shared where you can come in and pre-populate shipping addresses and you know financial instruments, that can be a huge game changer in conversion for merchants, right, number one. Number two, for merchants today, you know, the challenge is that, you know, everybody is deluged with choice in terms of what to buy. 
and where to buy, right? They all look for deals and then even when they look for deals and they come in, there are five things that look very similar. What should I go and buy? And so, you know, tailor making recommendations for them, you know, to help merchants get higher conversion, to get the buyers what they need. This continues to be the magic and I think as AI comes in and plays a role, it will continue to shape commerce and that's the place we are. Uh, Samir, coming to you, and same question from your vantage point and from your industry point. What is that one moonshot that's going to unlock the value in the market? See, we are we're basically partners with PFSI right, in, in helping them become better, become more efficient, and you know, deliver value from offshore centers. Um, and as I was saying earlier in the, in the break room, BFSI has been the probably a laggard in terms of adopting technology. Right? We still work with AS400s and so on and so forth. Um, in the same way, I think you know they have also looked up. They have basically ignored the efficiencies that their processes, you know, that were say designed several decades ago, could be reimagined. So technology, applying technology and applying particularly the AI and the Gen AI pieces, we are trying to reimagine those processes. And going back to our customers and advising them on, you know, that this 17, 18 step process can now be cut down to just two, and this is how to deliver efficiencies. So those are the aspects that we have been focusing on: financial data extraction, uh, data analytics, reporting automation, uh, aggregation, and then presentation of the data are some of the areas where we've been working on for some time. And I think you know we will be releasing solutions for our customers in that space in the next couple of months. Got it. Excellent. Automation, more automation. Uh, Rakesh, from your vantage point, what do you think that one moonshot that would be really negative in this question? Really made me think. <laughs> uh, so I think we had some elements, and uh, 15, 20 years back, you had to go to a school or college, you had to go to a hospital, and you had to come to a bank. Uh, so banks historically uh, are the custodians, and the 13 bankers to be to fail oligopoly. And suddenly we are waking up to a new reality where our uh, Loans business is being taken away by peer to peer lending, those platforms are getting visible. Our trade business is taken away by blockchain because there is complete disintermediation. Uh, and to the common colleagues sitting next door uh, from PayPal, I would like to believe customer experience design thinking and ability to give an experience which is very personal. I'll take an example. Last, to last week I was flying international to the US and the waitress came and told me. Mr. Roger, we had a favorite champagne. I was surprised because uh, somewhere somebody took note of that. There is data, there is analytics, there is memory, and it was very spooky. Uh, they have somebody out there who is doing some database management to check uh, what this person's preferences are. Uh, banks such as ours need to realize that we are losing business, we are losing customer base, and to your point on why we are doing what we are doing, we have to understand our client and tailor our services to make it personal. Today we are not there. So I think it's a disruptive trend, a tipping point, and I can tell you banks are losing sleep over it because I will go to the front office in terms of trying to consolidate what we have. Awesome. See, that's the beauty of some intellectual stimulation that we don't realize when the time flies and that when we are at the top of the hour. But just to summarize, the takeaway for the room, there is so much of customer centricity in BFSI that is happening. Uh, there is a supportive regulation which actually is helping us. Uh, there is a very different way of collaboration, strategic versus tactical. It's a choice where you feel yourself comfortable joining the dots between why and how. And nonetheless, <coughs> why doing all that, you know, be uh, proud innovators for the world. Uh, so it's a proud moment for all of us. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for taking <coughs> the time and spending some important ingredients with the room. Uh, hope you enjoyed. Have a great evening. Thank you.